Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our, <clears throat> excuse me, our workshop today. Hopefully you are here to join our uh, introduction to Kubernetes and GitOps, which will have uh, a series of short talks covering a variety of these topics, as well as a hands-on so that you not only learn about um, GitOps, what it is, um, how it's a natural evolution of Kubernetes, um, but you also get to leave with something actually working that you can continue to play with uh, and hopefully you can share with your teams. So hopefully you are here to do all of that. You have your laptop. Uh, we have plenty of time to make sure that you'll be successful uh, through all the steps. And um, we also have something special here today because we'll be coming up um, with a uh, kind of a new rendition of what we'll walk you through in the next couple of weeks. So if anybody's interested, we'll be asking you uh, to join a, sort of a focus group that we'll be putting together within the next uh, couple of weeks. So we would love to uh, hear from you if you're interested. Uh, so my name is Tamo Nakahara. Uh, I run the developer experience team. That's what the DX here is, our developer experience team here at a company called WaveWorks. Um, and I'm very uh, excited to have here a couple people um, on our team who will be uh, doing these talks on the intro to Kubernetes and GitOps. That will be covered by Kingdon, who's on our uh, um, developer experience team, as well as uh, David Stauffer. <laughs> Hello, Wave, um, as well as David Stauffer will join later, um, who will walk you through the steps um, so that uh, you will have something um, working on your computers uh, at the end of this. So uh, we've uh, asked in the chat if you have any particular problems that you're looking to solve, uh, please put them in the chat so we can actively be um, addressing them and you know seeing if we can incorporate them into this workshop, uh, as well as answer your questions in the chat. Um, we've also recently done a thing like at the end. Uh, so this is recorded. You'll all get emails with the um, links uh, to various resources and the recording of this workshop. Um, but at the end, <clears throat> so anybody who kind of got stuck or anything, we also um, did a thing where we stopped the recording and people can come on with cameras and whatever if you um, want to get uh, through the final steps. We are here to make sure that everybody is successful. Um, we'll go very slowly, so don't be shy about asking questions or uh, needing some um, backup information. Uh, we've got plenty of time. We block off two hours and we usually finish within 90 minutes, uh, even with all kinds of troubleshooting. So I hope you'll be uh, with us and successful. Uh, so Kingdon, David, and I all work for a company called Weaveworks. Uh, if this is your first time coming to one of our GitOps community events or uh, Weave user group events, welcome. Uh, Stacy is our community manager who's been putting together um, uh, this wonderful calendar of uh, talks. Uh, so uh, if this is your first time, you know, check us out on our uh, meetup page and you'll see that so much of the content that we talk about is open source, as uh, we will be talking about today. Um, our company has really been founded on uh, various projects that we kind of started out um, from the beginning. Some have now gone into the CNCF. Um, you, today, you'll be going through steps to install Flux, which is um, a CNCF project that has been in incubation. And we actually just yesterday um, had gone and completed our uh, steps to get the application started for the graduation process. So um, we've already done our security audit because that is a critical part of um, the project that we built um, and the community that contributes to it. Uh, so we're really excited about that journey. And um, so you'll be installing Flux today and you'll be hearing a lot about it because uh, it is really the project that uh, kicked off the term GitOps, uh, which our CEO coined and put out there after noticing that there was a kind of a general movement uh, in the field of people starting to do particular practices. Um, and as you'll hear from Kingdon, it's part of that evolution of, you know, kind of how Kubernetes works. So you'll see, you'll learn a little bit more about how Flux and Kubernetes work together to provide GitOps. Um, another person on our team, you might have heard of um, Stefan Prodan, uh, also saw this evolution and saw that, oh, there's a gap in the field and, you know, there's possibilities of using the technology that's here to do like canary deployments or blue green deployments, uh, practices that now kind of go under the umbrella of what's called progressive delivery. Um, and so that's also been folded into the Flux project. It uses um, Prometheus or other like Datadog or whatever metrics to be able to do those canary deployments. So it's really exciting to see more and more enterprises adopting Flux and Flagger. Um, we've got plenty of other open source projects, not even um, these just touch the surface of um, all the projects that we're involved in. Um, and we do all kinds of work such as uh, contribute to upstream, 
um, as well as um, you know work on other extensive uh, extending uh, open source projects here. So if you want to find out more, our website is weave.works, um, and we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, so a little bit of housekeeping, uh, as I mentioned, we'll have Kingdon, David, and, and I will be guiding you through this workshop. We have it bracketed off for two hours, but we're usually done by about 90 minutes. Uh, I think everybody knows how to use Zoom here. Uh, the main thing is to make sure in the chat box, that's the best way that we'll be engaging with you, answering your questions. I'll be monitor monitoring them. Um, but make sure that you post to everyone because we often get a chatty group and people are actually answering each other's questions, which is really, really lovely. Um, but if you don't post to everyone, then the people can't see your answers. So make sure you can change that now. Uh, so uh, the overall here is uh, we'll have about a 10, 15 minute talk on the intro to Kubernetes and how GitOps is the natural evolution of that journey. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we'll be putting you through steps of installing um, the CNCF uh, Flux project. Um, but we have this great open source and free project um, called Weave GitOps that will um, help you to install that in a very opinionated way. Um, so we kind of talk about two ways of installing Flux. So if you're absolutely brand new and uh, kind of brand new to GitOps, uh, then we have this free and open source way of doing it that kind of um, helps relieve sort of decision fatigue if you don't know like how you want things to be set up. Um, but it also installs Flux for you. And um, as you'll see, as um, we'll talk about a little bit in the next couple of weeks for this focus group um, that we'll be doing, if you'd like to be involved, um, we'll be kind of making that, that part a little bit more transparent in the future. Uh, and then uh, um, for people who maybe have um, already kind of done their homework uh, and, and you kind of know what you're looking for, then at least you'll also um, see the steps of, um, you'll see what it's like to have Flux and then you can kind of look later into the documentation and see if you kind of want to go with vanilla Flux. Um, always we uh, are showing kind of the, the main ways of, of getting started with GitOps so that you have something that you can play with and you can share with your teams. Um, I think the main thing that's the value of this um, Weave GitOps path that we're doing is it sets up your repo structure, which is kind of an area that where people kind of get a lot of uh, decision fatigue. So Stacy will be sharing um, various links um, for the workshop in the chat here, um, especially the getting started steps that um, we'll be following eventually. So there are prerequisites and stuff, but don't worry if you haven't done them, we will walk you through those steps as well. Um, so. Uh, now I'll shift over to Kingdon, who will give the intro to Kubernetes and GitOps talk. Perfect. There we go. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, I lost my slides. There they are. I see them. Okay. Um, I think they just need to be presented. I'm not in presenter view. Uh, no, I see a tiny little <laughs> box. <laughs> Okay, we'll try again here. Let's see. Yep. That would have been funny. <laughs> ah, well, now I see a interesting icon. That, there you go. Yeah, this is uh, James Webb, I think. Um, so uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm Kingdon. Um, trying to get oriented here so I can face the camera while I'm looking at my presenter view, but I'm just uh, going to go with it here. We'll see. All right. Perfect. Everything looks good now? Yes. I am Kingdon. Uh, I'm an open source engineer at Weaveworks. Um, thanks for the great introduction. I'm also a Flux maintainer. Um, I'm the cow on Twitter. Uh, so today we're going to talk about Kubernetes from a, a beginner uh, perspective and GitOps. And we're going to discuss uh, what is it that makes Kubernetes uh, useful for uh, businesses and how does GitOps uh, evolve that to be even more useful? So uh, Kubernetes is uh, basically at 30,000 foot level, it's container clusters. So you're building containers and you're running them on the cloud probably, uh, or on a cluster of computers. Um, and it's a modern operational stack. Um, Kubernetes is also an API or a number of APIs. Um, and there's a, a few examples of Kubernetes API here, like namespace, a pod, a service. Um, if you're familiar with those already, then you probably also know that there are more than just those things. Uh, there are a lot of things under the hood. The 
simply the core API has uh, at least all of these things in it. Um, secrets and config configuration maps for storing configuration data related to your deployments and uh, storage. Uh, there's persistent volumes and persistent volume claims. There are uh, systems for coordination um, like etcd. Uh, there are certificate management tools and networking uh, like network policies, uh, role-based access control. All of these things are part of Kubernetes and uh, all of these are problems that Kubernetes helps you solve. And then there are problems that Kubernetes natively did not help us solve. And for those problems, we also have the extensibility APIs. So uh, you can build custom resource definitions. Um, you can build controllers to manage those and to manage the life cycle of deployments or pods or processes related to those custom resources and operators. And um, those are what Flux is built on, uh, those, the extensibility API. So uh, GitOps helps you wrangle all of that complexity. And uh, it's sort of a set of cloud native best practices for Kubernetes. So if you have all of those different resources and you need to manage them somehow, well, Git uh, is a great way. And if you have thought about putting your configuration into Git, then you're already part of the way to GitOps. The rest is, um, is what we'll talk about throughout the course of this presentation. So uh, in the realm of ops and GitOps, we have continuous delivery and declarative configuration and automated delivery. Um, those are all topics that fall under the scope of Flux and GitOps. Uh, so, so as far as Kubernetes, back to Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is your control plane and uh, manages your data plane for your workloads. Um, it is also possible for you to have different experience with Kubernetes, depending on which uh, Kubernetes you are selecting. There, there are many Kubernetes distributions. There are cloud vendors that have managed Kubernetes offerings versus uh, Kubernetes is an upstream open source project that you can install yourself. Um, these all have a lot in common uh, because of the conformance uh, framework. That is under that underpins Kubernetes, so you mostly get the same experience across all of these cloud providers. But there can be different differences between them. Um, so centrally, what Kubernetes is doing is it's uh, providing a framework of declarative configuration where you can say what it is you want the state to reflect. How how should it be um, in terms of number of deployments? what images are running, how many replicas do they each have. And um, as you uh, define these things in the cluster, Kubernetes uh, controller manager or K Kubernetes cloud uh, manager, all the different components inside of Kubernetes sort of drive the state towards the desired state. So you define what you want and Kubernetes moves things in that direction until it's ready um, and lets you know when it is ready. So uh, when I describe what Kubernetes is and how you can use it, I like to start with this example because it's a bad example and it's a good example by being a bad example. Um, you can run a pod directly. You just give it an image, give Kubernetes an image and say kubectl run, um, and you will get a pod running a single container. And um, pods have a life cycle. Uh, pod is not really declarative because this is an imperative activity. We said run a pod and Kubernetes said, okay, I'll run it. And then that was the end of the conversation. Um, so doesn't say anything about upgrading. Pods are immutable. So if you wanna upgrade this pod, you will need to create another one. And um, so, so Kubernetes at its base level, that's what Kubernetes is, uh, but Primitives like pods, you don't usually work with them directly. You work with a deployment or you'll work with a stateful set. Uh, and those things do have a concept of upgrading built into their life cycle. You can update the image and new pods will be created. Um, so uh, pod definition is not really declarative uh, in terms of the whole life cycle because you will need to delete it and create another one in order to um, actuate you know, regular normal behaviors like upgrading that you want to deal with every day. 
So uh, deployment is uh, another primitive in Kubernetes that does uh, have facilities for that. And a deployment underneath is based on a replica set. Uh, in, in terms of history of Kubernetes, replica set supersedes uh, replication controller, which is the old way that you would do upgrades. Um, a replica set is better in a lot of ways that we don't need to go into. Uh, but a replica set is basically a definition of a pod spec and a count of replicas. Uh, so if you were to uh, compare deployments and replica sets and pods in a pod and in a replica set, the uh, pod spec is immutable. And in a deployment, when you change the pod spec, you get a new replica set and the scaling happens. And Kubernetes manages those things to try to make sure that your upgrade proceeds smoothly. Or if uh, something goes wrong and the new pods don't come up, um, then the old ones stay up until someone can come and, and uh, address the situation and figure out what went wrong with the upgrade. So these are declarative primitives and they rescue you from managing the imperative life cycle of your workloads. Um, and uh, there's a whole uh, readiness scenario that we just kind of described a little bit, uh, but uh, so the pods are immutable, replica sets are immutable, deployments are um, configurable. And that's part of the life cycle of objects in Kubernetes is uh, configuration. So there's other types of uh, resources that can create pods, as we mentioned, but the idea is that it's the same pod underneath um, and control loops um, drive all of these resources toward their declared state. Uh, so if it's a stateful set and you set replicas to four, then I guess they would come up in the particular order and uh, one would wait for the next, depending on how you have it configured, uh, cron job, all of these resources um, have uh, that sort of workflow to them. So when you're creating these resources um, and you apply them to your Kubernetes environment um, and the control loops are operating, you need a way to actually uh, manage that reasonably. So uh, we'll just uh, transition straight on to GitOps and explain how that is uh, happening. So uh, to describe GitOps, let's start with what would it look like if the desired state of the entire cluster was represented as a single artifact? And we'll call that artifact a git commit. So inside of the git commit, you put your Kubernetes YAML manifests, if they're uh, jobs or deployments or um, anything, uh, config maps, you can put them inside of Git and then um, allow uh, GitOps operator like Flux to deploy them to the cluster. Uh, GitOps is more than that. Um, there's this whole uh, definition of GitOps from opengitops.dev. This is from the GitOps working group. So we've already touched on what declarative resources are and what makes them more or less declarative um, and uh, what immutable resources are and what it means for them to be versioned. Um, this is sort of where uh, GitOps diverges from the notion of just keeping your configuration in Git, uh, that there should be a, an agent running inside of the cluster that monitors that source of truth to tell how it should uh, be configured inside the cluster. And if it finds a difference between what the source of truth describes and what's actually in the cluster, it will reconcile the change and tell Kubernetes, it's time to make a change. So by keeping your configuration in Git, this uh, provides visibility benefits and also security and compliance. Uh, you, you have capability to audit your configuration and how it changes over time. And if you um, make this the only way that configuration gets into your cluster, uh, that has a uh, major implication for security that if, uh, if things are only allowed to come into the cluster this one way, then they can be vetted and verified in uh, pull request reviews. Um, and developers who might've needed to have direct access to production clusters before, they no longer need that. They can work with the manifests and they can work with static analysis and they can work with uh, staging clusters. Um, and also uh, working with these uh, manifests in, in Git directly can help you surface important metrics like uh, how, 
how much time it takes for pull requests to merge and for things to arrive in production. Those are uh, like your Dora metrics. You want to make sure that things are um, not taking too long. Uh, so you need to start measuring those things. So keeping your configuration in Git and making sure that changes go through Git has a lot of benefits. Um, also for developers, not only for business, but developers also benefit when you adopt GitOps. Um, oops. Um, there is less knowledge required to interact with the cluster uh, and the cluster write credentials are not needed uh, anymore. You can uh, connect to the cluster and um, review through, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm losing uh, track here, exactly where I was. Um, so the benefits for developers are, um, capabilities uh, in terms of speed to deploy and automation. Uh, there are a lot of things that you get uh, benefits in terms of uh, being able to deploy your changes um, as they are built and pushed. So you can do like an image update automation, for example, where uh, we have a CI process that builds a new image uh, every time a commit comes, and then we want that image to be deployed in the cluster uh, well, that, that's GitOps. Um, and for platform teams, making that a clean interface uh, also is a very important benefit. So uh, when you have this system in place and you can explain it to your developers easily, um, it's uh, much easier to um, Uh, work with a number of teams. If you have a platform team where you're supporting developers from an, uh, many teams, uh, you, you want to have like a common interface that you can use to work with all of them uh, and help them uh, make their deployments stable and uh, fast and smooth. So this layer of standardization for delivery. So those are the key points of GitOps. Uh, you have declarative configuration, and you have it version controlled and with immutable artifacts. And uh, it is in a single source of truth, which is the Git repository um, and also automated delivery. So uh, as your changes are created, they can be deployed as quickly as they're created. Uh, here's, here's a little diagram of your system going into Git. And here's Reconciler um, comparing what it sees in Git to uh, what Kubernetes has and making uh, the changes active in Kubernetes, copying them there. Uh, so that I think is, um, lost my little presenter window here, but I think that is uh, nearing the end of the slides here. Um, agents running in the cluster, that's Flux or uh, we've GitOps, reconciling uh, definitions, and the concept of a closed loop is uh, sometimes not included in the GitOps definition formally, but I like to include it because that's where your security comes from. If you have changes that can be introduced to the cluster through any arbitrary, um, uh, well, wouldn't be arbitrary, but if your developers are applying changes directly to the cluster uh, and not going through Git, then those changes are uh, not uh, inspectable, they're not auditable. They can't be, um, especially uh, uh, the biggest uh, question we get is how do you deal with uh, incident management? What do you do when something goes wrong and you feel like you need to break the glass? Well, I, I tell people that's the last time I wanna go around Git uh, because if there's an incident ongoing um, and I need to hand it off to someone, I need to make sure that I can communicate what has already been done. Uh, and if I'm going around the uh, auditable source of truth because there's an emergency and I think I need to move faster, uh, that makes it less likely that I will be able to communicate completely what I have done uh, to try to resolve this incident. So that's the closed loop concept. Uh -huh. So this is a summary slide here, and those are all the benefits that we've discussed. Um, stability and reliability of your deployments, 
uh, consistency and standardization in your deployment interfaces, security guarantees, and uh, developer your, for your developer experience. Um, it's much better when you can uh, apply changes directly from a Git repository, from a pull request. When uh, you already have to use the pull request interface to communicate with your teams, uh, it's, it's much better when that is also the interface that you use to communicate with your clusters and not some um, form where you fill out, uh, please deploy this at such and such a time, administrator team. Uh, it's much better in terms of shifting left, which we hear a lot. So that's uh, wrapping up the end of my presentation here. Cool. Thanks so much. Uh, before we shift gears into actually doing GitOps, does anybody have questions um, regarding this talk? Um, and also just be curious if anybody wants to share, uh, don't be shy. You know, how, how new are you to this? Like, are you um, just getting started with Kubernetes? Are you, um, you know, have you been using it for a while, but you're kind of starting to trying to understand what this whole GitOps thing is about? Uh, we'd love to have your questions. Um, so I see that there was, I guess, an earlier question. Would you be able to discuss issues developers have in building applications on Kubernetes? Great question. I've heard that this is a major issue and I'd like to learn more. Awesome. Kingdom, what are your thoughts? I would love to know um, more about what, what type of issues you're hearing, because there are certainly a lot of issues. Um, how do I arrange my CI system? Um, can I use the CI system that I already have with GitOps? That's a good question. The answer is usually yes. Um, if uh, the problems are, uh, they range all over the place. There's problems like, how do I make my builds fast? That's a little bit outside of the domain of GitOps, but that's certainly a question that I'm very interested in. Um, um, and the question is kind of built, it's more broadly about building apps on Kubernetes itself. Do you have any thoughts on yeah, um, as far I guess as, we should say there are considerations and then there are issues. So uh, like, yeah, what are maybe considerations and then I don't know what the challenges might be. Well, when you build your apps on Kubernetes, uh, because you're probably using deployment for most things, you need to uh, make sure that you're building apps in a stateless way. Um, so if you're uh, looking for like a set of guiding principles for how to build your apps well, I like to point at the 12 factor principles, um, which still apply with Kubernetes in, a, in large part. Uh, so separating your um, build from run, uh, that's something that we say in a different way here. We say um, separate CI from CD, uh, put a line between them, and that makes a lot of things simpler. Um, people, when they come to GitOps, they often think that CI should still be the nexus of control for their deployments. And we try to dispel that notion because in the GitOps security model, we don't really want CI to have access to the production cluster. It shouldn't have direct access. Um, and there's a specific reason for that because CI is where your unvetted code is running. That's where, um, so, so just drawing that line there solves a lot of problems, um, making sure that the CI system is not also responsible for deployment. Um, not sure if that answers your question, but if you have any more uh, yeah. insight or details, I'm happy yeah. to. Definitely, definitely good points to um, highlight. And if anybody here um, is using, um, is building apps on Kubernetes, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. You know, any kind of practices you brought into place. Um, and that does remind me, um, you know, I, I noticed quite a few people joined after our intro. Um, one of the things we really highlight, um, you know, we'll be walking you through using um, the CNCF project Flux. Um, and security is absolutely, um, you know, foundational to how we've built the project um, and how, you know, our graduation experience is, is going and it's, it's really paying off nicely. Um, so, you know, a lot of these things that like King did mentioned, you know, these practices are in place because security is definitely um, uh, a primary, uh, you know, a priority. Um, all right, we have another question. How is the consistency of your application data store ensured when there is a need to roll back a broken version? What methodology do you employ? Thanks for the question. So, um, 
as far as database migrations and schemas go, uh, a lot of that stuff will live outside of the cluster in, in the design that we would usually propose. Uh, keeping a database inside of a cluster is certainly something that you can do. There's kubedb. Uh, there are a lot of solutions for that. Then there are solutions like, uh, um, I'm thinking of one in particular, I don't know the name, uh, where you can actually manage database migrations in a GitOps way. Um, maybe I can look that up and come back later, but uh, uh, there are a lot of different ways. And uh, the primary concern I think is about making your database migrations reversible, or at least being aware of when they're not. Um, so when you have to rename a column uh, in a database table, for example, you know, you might, um, you might not be able to make that uh, reversible change depending on your database engine. Um, so being aware of those issues, um, you can make those special touch points where you, you pay close attention. Uh, I don't think that's really a great answer, but um, keeping the database outside of Kubernetes, I think helps a bit at least uh, because you get to manage your cluster lifecycle separately from your database. Cool. Uh, thanks for that, uh, that question as well. Uh, any final questions? Uh, again, of course, uh, we'll shift gears, but if any questions do come to mind, feel free to put them in the chat and um, we'll be here to, to answer them there. Um, and then I do think with some of these, um, not to put David on the spot, but I think uh, as I talked about, um, we'll be using a free and open source tool that kind of helps you install Flux, the CNCF project, um, in a, sort of an opinionated way for people who are new and might have decision fatigue because there's a lot to understand. So some of these um, practices might come into play as well. So we'll see if we can address them there. Uh, all right, so thank you. We will shift gears now into the hands-on portion, which I will kick off with a little bit of a thing that I call the turkey dinner, um, because we'll be kind of going into the steps, and I think it helps to sort of keep the vision of you know what the end goal is, what the benefits are, um, and so kind of to reiterate on some of the things that Kingdon showed here um, on what uh, GitOps is and what its uh, benefits are. In this particular case, um, we'll, uh, the end goal for this turkey dinner, or the end goal for this uh, hands-on is to really get all these enterprise level um, benefits uh, from GitOps, right? And so again, for those of you who came in late, you know, all of us come from a company called Weaveworks. Um, we've been basically founded on open source and we were one of the earliest people to start using Kubernetes in production. We've been using it for at least seven years now um, with our own products. Um, and we've been consulting and supporting people through their Kubernetes and cloud native journey. So as you'll see here, both the open source flux that we'll be having you install, um, as well as the open source and free uh, thing that we call Weave GitOps, it's kind of like a flux wizard um, or a flux plus kind of a thing. Um, you know, we've been making sure that you'll have an experience that is very Kubernetes native, um, and it's also um, applicable to any Kubernetes um, distribution that um, you have. You know, we wanted to make sure that it was neutral and um, can be used. And it's also modular in terms of um, having, you know, the ability to have transitions, but also multi-cloud. We have many enterprise customers doing um, various things. And we also want to make sure that, as you'll see, the importance of, you know, consistency, security, uh, reliability is a core part of GitOps and why we present these workshops to you. And hopefully you want to make sure that you are successful. Uh, so a key part of this, um, and Stacy, our community manager here, um, has run several of our events called GitOps Days. Um, we'll, we can include a link in the email as well. We have all these great YouTube playlists from the last several years of people who have already been uh, running GitOps in production in their enterprise companies. Um, we have financial institutions. We have, um, you know, all kinds of industries, uh, retail, you know, consumer, and, and the people who have put this in place. Um, one of the main things, you know, aside from the technical and organizational benefits that they've had is, um, you know, it's down to the business. And um, it's one thing that comes out of all these great talks from GitOps days is that, you know, there's research that's already been done in the DevOps space. And it's the companies that can um, have reliability and most importantly, velocity are the ones that show all these other markers of business success, you know, like, I don't know, time to get next revenue, you know, next uh, more revenue or next investment or, um, you know, 
know, be able to develop faster and new features, you know, all these things, of course, have been tied to um, these metrics of business success. So for whatever uh, reason that uh, you got attracted to GitOps, um, hopefully you'll also be able to see these benefits as well. So what we'll be walking you through in this workshop is to have you have this success as an end goal. Um, and so what we'll be walking you through, as I mentioned, is free and open source. And the way we designed it as the way we think about our company is that it's Kubernetes native and it's Flux native. Um, so everything that you do, um, you'll see is built upon Kubernetes, built upon Flux. Um, that's not something that's going to go off in a different direction. So hopefully we're going to be giving you this sort of Flux wizard experience with something that you can take home um, and share with your team. Um, and one thing that we talk about is um, that people have their whole personal journey on the different levels that you'll be um, uh, traveling and, and advancing through um, your GitOps experience. So maybe today, if you're just getting started, you're going to be doing very simple things like, you know, single clusters, a, a, a simple app. Um, but over time, you know, hopefully you'll be managing teams and you'll have, you know, be using multi-tenancy, you'll have multi-cloud, and we have all these things um, available and, um, you know, ready to uh, assist you in whatever way you um, is helpful for you. Um, so think of today, I don't know where you are, maybe you're here at kind of the pericrit stage or core GitOps, you know, please, uh, we'll be giving you a Slack channel link, you know, hang out with us and tell us how things are going and we'd like to make sure that you're successful. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we also do provide support um, if necessary, um, but, you know, our core components should be able to get you through this journey and be able to use um, the CNCF Flux um, project, um, but with these additive uh, benefits to make sure that you have an enterprise experience like so many of our other customers and people who've been on this journey. Again, to reiterate the really importance, uh, importance of um, velocity, automation, resiliency, um, reliability, you know, we just have so many stories of people saying like, I no longer have a team that's uh, stuck to their um, beepers on uh, pagers on Saturdays, right? Or, or we're not doing these upgrades where everything uh, gets stopped or uh, somebody made a mistake and the whole system came down. Well, thankfully, because we're using uh, a version controlled system, we can, you know, we can see what triggered that. We know how to roll back. We know how to um, be able to use all the benefits of GitOps to minimize the downtime or the uh, challenges that can come into place with with those types of issues. Um, so yes, please keep the uh, this this vision in mind as we walk you through this thing we called Weave GitOps. Again, it's free and open source. It's built on Flux, uh, and we'll be showing you sort of this version that we've been um, putting out there for a while. But we're actually developing and we'll be releasing in a couple of weeks um, a version that has a slightly different way of coming um, at it, and will um, have I guess it'll be a little bit more transparent about. The, the Flux components of it. So, I mean, you'll, you'll be installing Flux today, but the steps will be slightly different. So if you'd like to join our um, focus group uh, next week, then let us know. And we'd love to have um, your thoughts on like how today's experience is different from the, the demo that we'll share in the, in the coming weeks. So with that, I hope you're excited. I hope you have your laptops. Uh, like I said, we'll go about this very slowly. I'll ask questions a million times. If anybody gets stuck, we'll, hopefully you, you won't be shy and you'll raise your hands and, and we'll help you through it. And uh, we'll have Davi join and walk us through the steps. Yes, good evening, good, good day, depending where you are. Um, and we're gonna do today this nice, um, workshop. So let me just make sure that I'm sharing the right screen. All right. So what we're going to do is everybody needs to open this URL, which is docs.gitops.bf.works, because we're going to follow this getting started guide. And we need some prerequisites. We need to double check that everybody has. So we need a GitHub account. GitLab should work as well. Um, you should have kubectl installed and we need a Kubernetes cluster. Um, you're so, free to use, yes, whatever okay. cluster you want. We recommend for this, because this is what we're going to do together, that you use kind. And if you're using kind, this requires Docker. Yes. 
So let's pause there. Um, as um, David mentioned, um, if you already have GitLab, that does work. Um, if not, uh, and you don't have a GitHub account, it just takes a few minutes. So um, raise your hand or let us know if you Sorry, I just muted myself. So let, let us raise your hand or let us know if you know, need a few minutes to do that. It's no big deal. Um, just checking any hands, anybody. I, we usually have a, you know, a, a good handful of people who um, don't have GitHub accounts. That's not a problem. Um, and one other thing we've talked about in the past is um, the, uh, the kind installation also is very quick. We've had people who don't have kind, they were able to get it uh, installed. But uh, if anybody has, for example, EKS, uh, that works directly, right? They don't need kind if they're using something like EKS. Is that right, David? Yes, yes. yes. Any, yeah. any Kubernetes cluster will probably do. Um, okay. I think, yeah, we are just bound to the version that Flux supports, but I think Flux supports everything above um, one sixteen. Correct. Okay. Uh, and um, let us know if uh, anybody does not have kubectl installed, um, and we have the link to the instructions there too. Actually, I think you need Kubernetes at least version one point twenty point six now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So if you're on a lower version than that, it won't work. Yeah. Which which uh, version was that again? 1.20.6. Uh, anybody on an earlier version that needs to upgrade or I guess install this in a, a fresh place. So I'm seeing a comment. Uh, okay. Okay, we're so, looking at the updated docs. Oh, yeah. Stacy, are and, you saying that there's a different link or is that the same link? Looks like the same link we just shared. No, there, yeah. there's a version selector. There's it's a version. Confused. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I just oh. copied the correct version because I realized that I pasted the wrong version in there. <laughs> yes. Oh, and I apologize. Yes, someone's asked about Windows installers. No. So we don't have Windows. Um, no. Is there a workaround? Is there something that people can do if they're using Windows? Um, no, I mean, Windows today has kind of a Linux environment as well, right? You could use this, this, this Linux environment, they ship with it and try it with this. I didn't, I have not tried it yet myself, uh, but there's a good chance that this should work. Okay. So apologies for that. I should have mentioned that uh, earlier. Uh, anybody else raise your hand if you are using Windows and do we have, uh, is there a link to instructions uh, if someone's using Linux? Um, is there anything? I mean, no, there's nothing special about this, right? It's, okay. It should just work. Okay. Um, us... All right. Okay, so let's so just check in. Doing? Let's check in on the prerequisites. Who needs time? Raise your hand, send, give us a note on the chat. Uh, Anybody else need a Linux workaround for Windows? And thanks for sharing that. We really appreciate it. Uh, and as I mentioned, I think some people maybe who came in later, um, we have this recorded. Uh, and then at the end, we're happy to also um, stop the recording if anybody just wants to jump on uh, camera or something or on microphone, uh, if they still were not able to uh, go back. But in general, as you can see, we'll be pausing because we want to make sure that everyone is successful. This workshop is not successful if we roll forward and everybody else is stuck. So uh, let us know in the chat or raise your hand uh, if there's anything that you need. Um, okay, so I'm going to assume people are still kind of wrapping up prerequisites, but we'll at least start uh, showing the part on installing Weave, the CLI for Weave GitOps. Okay, so you need to command to copy this command um, and basically this and paste it in, in your terminal window. I already did this, so um, I will not do this because my internet is a bit too slow. And if I check GitOps version, I should see that I'm already on the correct version, which is 0.6.2. And you can already see this uses this specific flux version. So this means, for me, everything is ready to go. 
but you probably still need to, to download this um, with this curl command. And yeah. Cool. And then the how, other thing we need. Yeah. How many, how often does that generally take for people who are brand new? It was like a couple minutes? It really depends on your bandwidth. So yeah, that's true. Um, on, on, I think it's like 130 Mbit or something. So okay. I think on, yeah, um, it depends really how, how much throughput you okay. have. Yeah, I don't think and, we've had anybody sitting for 30 minutes or anything. Or no. Even 10 minutes. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Um, I'm just checking in to see if everybody's able to get to this step or still creating GitHub accounts or getting cute cuddle. Anybody having any error messages? So, and don't be shy. We've definitely done these many times and <laughs> halfway through someone will finally raise their hand and like, oh, I'm still having trouble with cube cuddle. No problem. We're happy to help you. Um, okay. So, and, and yeah. Okay. The other thing we need to do is we need to create a, a repo. It is our config repo, which will basically contain our on our configuration for our platform and our applications on it, but not the the the, the, the application repos itself. So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna go to GitHub and we're gonna create a new repo. And if you use like me this name, then the, the getting started guide is a bit more helpful because it will be reliant on this name, but it can be anything. So in GitHub, if you have never seen it, you can from the web UI easily create like this in your repo. The only thing you need to make sure is that you add a readme file because we want to have a branch and we want basically to initialize the repo. This is important. If not, there's nothing. And you can choose if, if you want it to be public or private, this doesn't really matter. And this is basically the first step we need to do. This will be our config repo. The other thing we need to do once we have done this is we need to fork pod info and the, the, the application repository with the deployment.yamls. So if we go to this link, this is basically if we look into this, this is contains the, the Kubernetes deployment.yamls to, to make pod info work. This is the application we're gonna deploy. And if you're wondering what pod info is, this it's this cute little app that Stefan wrote and, and part of VA works where we can test that um, something is working. So what we need to do is now let's Back let's again. pause let's pause for one second um actually i was gonna see uh, i'm happy to pause the recording if anybody just wants to jump on the microphone and let us know if anything is not working out or you need help uh raise your hand and i'm happy to do that we could pause the recording just if you want a quick verbal uh, assistance any raised hands does the silence mean everybody has completed the prerequisites, downloaded the CLI? And here, you know, again, I assume if you never used GitHub before, you know, we, we want to go through this part slowly too, because you're probably not that familiar with the GitHub interface. Anyone, anyone? Any raised hands, questions? All right. Um, okay. Go ahead. So if we're here, we need to fork this because we need a copy of this for ourselves because as well, we're gonna commit some changes directly there. This will be the repo where we have our deployment.yamls. And if we make a change to this, Flux will pick this up and it will get reconciled. And to do this, we need basically ownership of this repo. So what we need to do is to fork it. I'm gonna fork it to my personal account. And that's basically it for now. This is the, the two steps we need to, to in preparation and in terms of Git. 
And the next step is we need to create a cluster if we don't have a cluster. I don't have a cluster yet, so I'm going to create one. So what I'm going to do is kind create cluster. And this will basically start to lift up a cluster. If you're wondering what my, 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 my setup here is, I have two watchers on the right side and they will basically watch one, the, the Vigo, basically the, our GitOps namespace where all of our flux stuff lives. And the other watcher we will use once we really start to play with our application. Um, and now you can see this, this takes depending on your machine a moment, right? Or maybe you have already a cluster and you can as well use Minikube or whatever you want to use. Um, yes, but the quintessence is that we, we need a cluster. So. Oh, while we're waiting for this, Kingdon was sharing that uh, he's going through the steps today using Rancher Desktop. So we'll see how that works. So, yes. So the last step is I'm gonna copy or change my my cube cutter context, and now I'm ready to go. So we have a Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so that's the big first step, especially for those of you who might be absolutely brand new to Kubernetes. Um, hopefully, these steps are not too painful to start uh, your first. Kubernetes cluster. Um, anybody have challenges? Anybody want to jump on the mic, ask a question or have chat? And yeah, let's uh, reiterate uh, sort of the, the main um, kind of practices here. Um, as David mentioned, the reason that you um, set up your repo is that you have a, a place where you have your config, right? That's the absolute GitOps. It's the single source of truth. It is the um, file that um, all of these systems will look to to say like, what is this? What is the state of the cluster supposed to be? So that's why that's important to set up. Um, and now you have your cluster. All right, Let's see what's next. All right. So the next step is probably the most exciting one because we're going to install actually wave GitOps and Flux onto the cluster and we're going to use this command. Now you need to be a bit careful because this command assumes first that your repo is called wave GitOps config. And here it still, it needs uh, uh, that we, we declare our username, right? So basically this URL needs to be correct. And basically in my case, it's pretty straightforward because I'm using Git as well. If you're using um, GitLab, this is not working. So you need to copy the correct URL. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna paste this command because I'm a bit lazy and I'm gonna change my username. And this will basically specify what we use as config repo. And if I now, executes this command GitOps install with this path. What should happen is first of all, it needs basically to, to get permissions to talk to our, our GitHub. So it detected automatically that we, we, we are speaking to GitHub through the URL. And what we need to do is we need to follow this device login flow. So I need to go and open this URL. And it requires now this code from here. And basically what we do is we authenticate um, our CLI tool um, with, with Git so that we can make changes to this repo. So now, ah, I still need to authorize this, but now I, my device is connected and this should now, yeah. You can see that my, my deploy key is generated and uploaded to my Git provider. And what is happening now, something interesting on my cluster, my Flux controllers are coming up in, 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 my, in, in the Flux or basically in the Vigo namespace. 
So you can see we have here our source controller, our notification controller, our customized controller, the image reflector controller, automation controller, and the helm controller. And once they are all switched to ready, we are good to go. So this will depend as well how, how quick your cluster is a moment and how quick it can pull the images and so on. Um, so again, your internet bandwidth from, from the cluster will matter, but it should be normally done quite quickly. Let us know if this is failing for somebody. This is yep. a good definitely, step. definitely want to hear any error messages people might be getting. It's also putting uh, some questions. Anybody is anybody here using GitLab? Who's using GitHub? Anybody trying uh, Kingdon's Rancher desktop uh, <laughs> setup? So yeah, let us know. Uh, and was okay. We have a question. Can you please explain what each of those controllers do? Ha <laughs> ha! What a big question. <laughs> yes, that's a great one. Um, so we'll give a little bit of background. So uh, Flux, the CNCF project, um, is designed to be um, you know a microservices architecture so that uh, one, um, it makes troubleshooting you know easier uh, because it's it's broken down. And you know we hope uh, as people start getting familiar with them, uh, it makes contributions easier too. Um, it's it's great to see more and more people um, kind of picking the controller that really you know is doing some great things and then actually starting to contribute to them um, we're seeing you know friends from various companies doing that so um i don't know if, uh yeah do, do you want to pick and choose a few of these controllers davi that you want to highlight or kingdom you want oh, to yeah yeah kingdom can probably jump in and explain in more detail but basically we they are already quite well explained as well as the flux documentation when you want more insights but um Kingdom, do you want to go on the controllers quickly? Yeah, the two that I would highlight first are the source controller and the customized controller. Um, the source controller goes to your Git repository or a different source, it can be like an S3 bucket uh, or uh, in, in the case of the middle there, there's the Helm repository. Um, so the source controller is generally responsible for going out and fetching artifacts and then the customized controller is responsible for applying them to the cluster. Um, or if they're Helm artifacts, a Helm chart would be applied by the Helm controller. Those are generally how the controllers are uh, divided apart. And then the uh, there's only three left. We might as well say what they do. The image reflector controller uh, does kind of a similar thing, but the sources are not um, artifacts, they're images. So the image reflector controller isn't actually pulling the images into the cluster. It's just pulling the list of tags and it's part of the whole image automation assembly. Um, so the image automation controller doesn't have to also have code for uh, all of the various places where it might need to fetch images from. It just needs to understand list of tags. So all of these are microservices. They're, they're all given a small and simple job. Um, that, of course, doesn't stay that way, but it's uh, from a design perspective, that's how we do. And then the notification controller is responsible for communication between these things um, in a, a number of ways. Um, so if there are notifications that need to come from outside of the cluster, like uh, GitHub or Harbor or any other image repository or GitLab, um, then the notification controller takes those in and it translates them to uh, events that the rest of the Kubernetes cluster things can understand um, to make uh, subscriptions uh, work in the way that a Kubernetes user expects a subscription to work. So fast, yeah. in other words. Awesome. Thanks Thank for you. asking that question. <laughs> Shows you're paying attention. Excellent. And it, it makes me realize also, like maybe for our next um, uh, places where we're pausing, we can give some kind of overviews as flux as well uh, for those of you who are brand new. So as well, what we can see now, this as a final step, this is as well important. I created a pull request against our GitOps config repo and it provides a deep link to this pull request. So, so let's see and open this pull request, what it has done. So what it has done, it wants to basically add to our GitOps config repo 
this kind of files, right? And it sets up some, some simple configuration here. And the first source where it's basically using our Git repo and it's sending up, setting up uh, some customizations. Here as well, regarding the question, um, you can set here, for example, with this value, the interval, how often Flux goes out and looks for, uh, or basically fetches again from the source. So what we need to do now is basically merge this into our repo because we want this already part of our configuration repo. Um, and basically this we are now done and we have basically bootstrapped successfully um, our GitOps config repo, which is now a source for our, our cluster to look up what, what should happen next. Um, let me see where we are in our getting started guide. So we did all of this. Um, we go now and do, do, do something more useful, which is basically deploy an app. So we have built a UI. You can do this as well via the CLI. So we're gonna do, we're gonna copy this command, which is GitOps UI run. I'm gonna execute this in a different tab. And here is our UI. Um, this you can see as well in my watcher. This is the UI, the Vigo app. Um, and what we're gonna do is, let's remind ourselves, we want to deploy pod info. We're gonna deploy this application. So I'm gonna give it a name. I'm gonna say um, which namespace this should go in. The default is Vigo system. This will really store the automation objects in the right namespace in the Kubernetes cluster. And here comes the other key part. We need now to specify where our source repo URL is. And this is my, no, this is, yeah, this is put in for deploy. Yeah. So I need to copy this URL. Um, where's my UI? And we need to authenticate with GitHub again, right? So now our UI needs to, to, to basically able to talk to Git. So we're going to identify as well our UI. We're going to authorize this. And if I go back, this is good. Range and our config repo URL. So this is important because this will basically write as well the automation objects we need um, in, in, our, in our config repo. So we're going to specify this path. In my case, it's David Stauffer GitOps config. And this is basically it. And we're going to pinch submit. And now you can see we created again a pull request. Let's see what happens. So in our config repo, this is the first source we added to Flux. We want to add now this manifests, which this files here, which let me see, it's GitOps adding pod info deploy. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna add this new customizations and instructions to, to Flux to pick up this new source, right? Which is basically pod info deploy. Um, and if we now, this is what we're going to do. We merge this pull request. We don't need the branch anymore. We delete this. What we should see is that Flux will pick this up in a short time period. And this is the namespace, which is basically watching um, the namespace where the, this app goes in. Um, I think it's called namespace test, actually. And we should see a peer pod info the back end and the front end. Sometimes it takes a moment. Yes, because it has an interval and I think the interval was set to one minute. Um, but now you can see how our pods are coming up, the front end and the back end pod. And basically like this, we have deployed successfully um, our first application via um, GitOps. It was 
such easy. Um, cool. And we have a question. I, I think you mean uh, pool. So the question is, how often are the sources, uh, I think, pooled for changes? Yes. So we, we, we showed this. You can set this up. And in, in this case, it was basically set to one minute. Yeah. Okay. This was the interval. Um, all right. So now we should check that our, our, our stuff is really running. And we can do this by different ways. I like that we check actually that the app is up and running. So what we need to do is a port forward because we don't have an ingress or something configured. So what we're going to do is I'm going to start this port forward. And if I now go to this URL, I can see port info is up and running on my cluster. So this verifies that this is working. We can as well, I think if I remember correctly, we have in the UI now our first application, which is port info deploy. And if we go here, we see this, this, this um, graph of Kubernetes objects. And we can see with the indication here that they are all up and running. So this gives us as well a visual hint that everything is good. The same we can see basically this is the last time it um, fetched the source and, and basically the status of this. So this succeeded and we can see what is the fetched revision. And this is matching our last um, commit. Um, our last revision and we can see that as well our automation conditions are good because we can see that they are equal so the applied revision which is up and running is the same like the last fetch one so this is good and this gives us another indication that everything is good and working questions so far uh, I, I forget all the time tomorrow that people cannot speak so yes <laughs> um, well that was i was going to remind it's great to see nobody has left everybody's uh, still sticking through this so um yeah again uh, i'm happy to pause the recording if anybody it's easier to just jump on the microphone and ask any quick questions did you get any error messages did you get stuck at any point did you get stuck eight steps back we are happy to um go back and make sure that you're successful doing this uh, hopefully like, in the meantime you're also seeing GitOps in action right um you know we want to make sure that you're well, first of all you heard the talks on kind of what it is and and it's and it's sort of history um hopefully you're seeing it in action demoed here uh but then we finally also want to make sure that you have it on your own computers um and can and can share with others so um yeah let us know first of all <laughs> did any of uh of what David just showed, um, not maybe, was any of it not clear? Like, why was that GitOps? Um, what aspects of it, you know, exactly made it GitOps? Or if uh, any of you have any challenges, then we're happy to go back. Um, and we're happy to show something again if you're like, oh, I kind of missed that. I didn't really understand what was going on, so I didn't understand what the magic was. Um, all right, we'll wait for uh, if you have any oh, um, question. How do you automate the Git authentication process? Thank for your question. Yes, so this is um, a good question. So I, I Kingdon, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, the uh, authentication process that you see here was added, uh, I think, because we found that people were having difficulty with the Git uh, tokens. Um, and I think that we probably uh, changed our mind about that. Uh, it may change again in the future. Um, the short answer is if you have a GitHub token, uh, you can use that instead. Just export it in your environment. Then um, I, I, and, yeah, and probably... the, the longer answer probably would involve more details about where uh, where that token is stored or the fact that it's not stored by default. Uh, we create a deploy key instead in the repo. Um, which is uh, part of the normal Flux Bootstrap inst installation instructions. Uh, you use a GitHub token to create a deploy key. So that's probably the answer that you're looking for. Great. We also have some other good questions. Um, can you show me where in GitHub the state of your GitOps deployment lives? Is there a Kubernetes secret attached? If so, can we see? Thank you so much. Great question. 
I'm I'm a bit unsure what you mean by state because I mean the state is finally happening. This is what is happening in your Kubernetes cluster. We in in Git we are really storing what is the desired state, right? So what what we would like to be the state. So um, I'm guessing it means yes, where is the Git. YAML file? Is that what it means? Where in GitHub is the is the config? Yeah. We didn't look at the pod info deploy repo, did we? We we did already. We can go yeah. back to yeah, let's, this. Yeah, let's um, show again. So pod info deploy is basically one of the repos we forked. And here we have, for example, the, the deployment.yaml for front end services. So this is what we instructed then basically git or um, to, to be reconciled and if you remember mine correctly we we this instructions we added to the GitOps config repo we used so in this repo if i go here apps and i see my pot info deploy and basically here we have our customization and our other files we need this this app.yaml which describes basically um, what we want to deploy so basically here are living the manifests or the automation artifacts that we need. So, yeah, so hopefully that answers that question. And then the question was, uh, additional question was, is there a Kubernetes secret attached? I'm unsure for what we- This is a public repo, right? Yeah, so yeah, this no is public, you don't need. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, certainly, uh, can use secrets in, in other yes. uh, use cases. Uh, we just don't have it for this demo. Maybe Kingdon, do you want to explain some other examples of when people are using secrets? Yeah, so the deploy key that we mentioned earlier is uh, the secret that would be attached if you needed a secret for a private repo or um, the other use case that's common is for image update automation. Um, and in that case, Flux actually needs to write commits back to the repo so that in that case, you would use a read, write, deploy key um, that has permission to write to the repo. Um, and that is just stored as a secret. Uh, there's, a, there's a command called flux create secret that you can use to create um, secrets in various configurations if you need to connect it to uh, GitLab or GitHub or any other uh, repository and you want to make sure that you're creating an SSH key in the correct format, flux create secret is really handy. Awesome. Uh, no, normally that's handled by bootstrap, but depending on what configuration you build, it, it could go anyway. Okay. Um, and we have another question, but just to remind people, um, so we do still have a little bit of time and we will be showing a few more kind of use cases like around, uh, you know, uh, disaster recovery, or if anybody's using Helm, we, we can definitely um, show some stuff or, or answer some questions there. So um, the question we have here is uh, Flux itself inside the cluster is the one actually deploying the apps. Is that correct? So Flux technically isn't deploying nothing. It's it's only making sure that this deployment.yamls, where, where do we have? We already skipped this. Yeah, I would, I would have said yes, but I, I would have said yes with an asterisk because That's Flux is deploying uh, the manifests, but their Kubernetes is doing all of the hard heavy lifting. Yeah. Uh, yes. I think this goes back to Kingdon's talk, right? Is that how GitOps is this natural evolution of Kubernetes and Flux is a natural extension of Kubernetes itself. And so there's a lot of things that Kubernetes is doing and a lot of things that Flux is helping out with, but that's a great question to sort of clarify that, right? Yeah, so would you say like Flux is sort of the trigger so that Kubernetes itself does the deployment? It, it's making sure that actually Kubernetes deploys something, right? So yeah. so yes, it's it's depending a bit how you look on it because yeah, this is basically our instruction to Kubernetes, right? Here we are specifying what Kubernetes should do, and and with Flux we make sure that this ends up in 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 the cluster. Um, so yes, from Git. So you I can agree probably with you. Uh, think about it in terms of how how this whole scenario would play out if you didn't have Flux, and that's where maybe there's a ticketing system and you email someone to say, 
please deploy these manifests to the cluster. And that person's job is to go and check. Uh, and and uh, that's how we used to do things where. Uh, yeah. And then that person, uh, you know, has a family emergency and then you're like, oh no, <laughs> is it happening? Does anyone else know how to do <laughs> things? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, thank you so much for your great questions. Please keep them coming. Uh, in the meantime, yeah. uh, David, back to you. Yeah, I mean, let's start with why we think GitOps is so important, right? And this is, for example, let's let's produce kind of a small disaster and and see how GitOps can can help us, right? So this is the fun part. Let's start with bad actor, right? Let's let's assume that somebody did a mistake mistakes happen all the time and what we're going to do is we're going to delete a deployment and we're going to delete this front-end deployment we looked the whole time on so what we're going to do is um let's see if i still have yeah i will use this terminal window so i'm gonna delete the the deployment and what should happen is that you can see that it's terminating directly here's a pod but let's remind ourselves that this is not a problem because our configuration our desired state is declared in git so even if a human directly interacts with our cluster like this like magic our front end will come up again because we our desired state is declared in git and basically Flux is fetching it again and making sure that this is the thing that runs. It will reconcile again. Um, so this is basically how you don't, can be really confident that your environment is, is solid and not breaking. And if you're confident as a team, this will really enable you to ship quicker. So as well important part of the GitOps story is how it really enables you to, to be more confident and like this ship quicker. So, and now the last exercise we're gonna do is let's assume we want to make a desired change, right? Let's assume somebody opened a ticket and they want to change something. So what we're gonna do is as just an, as an exercise, we're gonna change the, the pod info UI color. Let's again, remind us how this app looks and we want to change the background color. And we only do this because it's a nice exercise and we're gonna do this via environment variable. So what we're gonna need to do is basically we need to edit the right file. And now it gets interesting, right? We, we're not gonna touch the platform repo, which is GitOps config. We're gonna touch the repo that, for example, the team is really working on, right? They don't need access to your whole platform repo. We can really separate concerns and we can say this team, they want to do this change. So what they need to do is they go to deployment.yaml um, and I'm gonna edit this file. And here we have the pot info UI color, right? And let me see again what it was. We want to change it to, to gray. So we need this color code um, so i'm gonna copy this and now you can see how we can order changes so we're gonna commit this changes and we're gonna create a pull request right because normally we should really have a review so let's say in this case, I'm the same person who will approve it. Normally, this is not the best thing to do, but peer review is very powerful. So we're going to merge this. We're going to confirm the merge. Um, we can clean up as well. We don't need the branch anymore. And what should happen is, oh, you can see how quickly it, it picked it up. So Flux already uh, reconciled this. It brings up the new pod. It brings down the old port terminates it and we only use basically a simple port forward. So we need to port forward again because this port doesn't exist anymore. Um, if you have, would have a solid ingress, this would be a bit more elegant. And if we go now to port info, you can see this is gray. And now imagine that this introduced a big problem, a bug. Um, we don't need to worry that much because we have 
our audit trail in um, Flux, uh, in Git, sorry. First of all, the person who needs to debug this can actually see what change was introduced and when, right? They can see, oh, this is what we changed um, specifically in this file and this caused the problem probably. So I make the decision that we need to roll this back. And this is the other um, nice thing we can do is now we revert this change easily, right? And this is of course functionality that um, gives us source control. So we're gonna change again this, we're gonna create this pull request. Um, I'm gonna directly merge it. We're gonna confirm this merge. I'm gonna clean up the branch and Basically, this change should go in any second. Um, it's fetching every minute. So there's a nice UI functionality, actually. Where, the, where do we have our UI? We can as well poke Flux and say sync app. And like this, we, we poke it to, to reconcile right now. So you can see it's now reconciling already. And yeah, and this is how we we we. First of all, we, we understood what's happening. So we were able to actually inform ourselves to determine the, the triage, what is the problem very easily. And we were capable of and rolling back in a very controlled manner. And this again, gives you confidence and makes your life much more easy. We need again to restart our port forward because this port is now terminated and not existing anymore. But if we go back, we can go, we can enjoy the rest of our Sunday with our kids um, because it's up and running again. And this is basically, or whatever you do on a Sunday, um, this is basically, I think, everything. So here we have completed. Cool. Yeah, I hope that uh, helps uh, provide kind of a demo for people on, uh, you know, kind of part of that turkey dinner as well. If you like to um, go through those steps as well later on your own, uh, they're all there, right, on the getting started guide, uh, disaster recovery sample. Am I right, David? Yes. Okay. I think, I think, <laughs> I think uh, David yeah. can hear me. <laughs> it's funny to try to read David's face. Um, cool. Uh, and yes, we also mentioned sometimes people ask questions about uh, if you use Helm, you know, are there any considerations here? Uh, anybody here use Helm? Anybody have additional thoughts before we wrap up? Um, if not, um, uh, just checking the time, we usually are kind of perfectly on time as usual. So um, Stacy will share a link to uh, join our Slack channel if you're new to it. Uh, if you're already on our um, Weave Slack, that's where we have a Weave GitOps channel. Um, but also on CNCF Slack, we have our Flux channel. Um, so just a reminder, uh, even though this thing is called Weave GitOps, um, it's really kind of a great free and open source uh, Flux wizard, Flux tutorial, Flux Plus, etc. Um, and a right reminder as well that in the coming weeks, um, we'll be sort of revealing the redesign of it. So if anybody here would like to join our kind of focus group to give some um, feedback on what the getting started experience like is, is uh, go, uh, compared uh, to what you just experienced with the, the new way that we'll be showing, um, we'd love volunteers. So if anybody is interested in just giving feedback on, you know, what works, um, also, whether it is a helpful on ramp to flux for people who are coming brand new to it. Um, again, I think it's sort of two different kind of large groups. Like, you know, if, if you've sort of done all your homework, you kind of know what your repo structure needs to look like, you have kind of the considerations all um, kind of lined up, then, you know, flux bootstrap is, is ready on the flux docs. Um, however, if you're like, I'm just getting started with Kubernetes and trying to figure out what this GitOps thing is about, um, this Weave GitOps is, you know, again, free and open source, it's opinionated, it kind of gets you set up. Um, hopefully, um, you know, we took our time here, but like a lot, a lot of people can get it done in under 45 minutes and, and have all those things set up. So, um, you know, hopefully it removes a lot of decision fatigue and gives you something that you can start with and then 
move forward, moving forward, you can kind of decide whether it continues to work for you, um, you know, whether you want to make changes, whether you want some clusters using this and some clusters using vanilla flux, you know, we'd love to continue the conversation with you. And, um, and yeah, give us give us feedback on it. Um, so yeah, okay, thanks for all the thanks. Uh, so with that, I think we'll officially end the recording. And if anybody does want to join, like if you did get stuck 15 steps back and you, you do want to complete, we are happy to help you here. So um, again, thanks to Stacy, our community manager for organizing this and Kingdon and David for joining us and all of you with your fantastic questions. You were all fairly quiet in the beginning and then all the, <laughs> all the questions flooded in. I was like, oh, okay, people are paying attention. So that's really, really good.